Joining us now is Jim DeFiti, host of Facing South Florida. I know that you have Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz on your show this week, and of course you asked her about these reports. Uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't planned ahead. It just happened to have her scheduled. And let's play the first bit of sound. This is exactly what Debbie Wasserman Schultz's reaction was to Donald Trump's comments. I think we can no longer make any bones about the fact that the president is a racist. So it's pretty bare, pretty straightforward. But I thought what was more interesting was talking about the issue that Elliot just discussed as well, which was the role that Mario Diaz Ballard is playing. He was in that Oval Office meeting, yet he's remained unusually silent at this point. And so I asked her whether or not she thought that Mario Diaz Ballard should come out and say something about what happened at that meeting. And here's that sound. Mario Diaz Ballard has been uh, a champion for his community, and I'm confident that he doesn't subscribe to what the president believes in, but it is incumbent upon all of us who believe in the United States be continuing to be the beacon and haven that we have always been for the oppressed uh, to speak out. And, and I don't, I, I, I think that if you don't speak out, then essentially you are tacitly sanctioning the remarks. I want to turn to so let's talk about Mario diaz Bellart and what his motivations might be for staying silent. Look, uh, Mario is a chess player in a lot of ways, and so I can envision that what he's doing here is by staying silent, by not criticizing or condemning the president, he hopes to be able to stay in the room and be one of those figures who can craft some sort of reform and some sort of plan moving forward for DACA and immigration. I understand that. But the question that keeps getting asked to me by Haitian leaders, we talked to John Monestine as well, county commissioner, others, and is at what point do you draw a line in the stand? You know, when do you finally decide that enough is enough and you have to stand up and confront this type of bigotry when it's spoken in front of you? You know, there were very few people inside that room who could speak to what the president actually said, and Congressman diaz Bullard is one of them. I've reached out to his person, his press person, to invite him to come on the show. He was on our program earlier in the week. She said that he's not available to join us. I asked, will there be any more clarification of the statement that he released, which was very sort of wishy-washy. It didn't sidestep the question of what the president's words were. He's going to be up for re-election in November. Will he have to, to answer that question at some point? You know, I think it's an untenable position he's placed himself in. I think it's a little bit of never having had a real serious challenger for years. He doesn't worry about it in terms of the election. He's used to doing things his own way. But at some point, you have to sort of step forward. The pressure is mounting. There are going to be stories in the Herald. There are going to be stories here. We're going to discuss it more on Facing South Florida. And it begins to ask yourself if President Trump had made these comments about Cuban Americans, about Cubans, would he be as silent today as he is when it relates to Haitians? Now, as, as we found out, you know, John Monacine said he's traveled to Haiti with Mario diaz Bullard. He believes Mario diaz Bullard is sympathetic to Haitians and, and is opposed to ending TPS for Haitians. But he needs to stand up. He needs to confront the injustice publicly. Otherwise, as Debbie Wasserman Schultz said, it's a tacit acceptance of it. And uh, coming on that topic, it seems to have hit South Florida in particular sure. in a different way than some of the previous comments the president has made or the actions he's taken uh, about Muslims, about Mexicans, um, about various other groups. But now it seems to be hitting home harder because we have such a huge population One, here. because I think largely that's part because the president came to Little Haiti. He was the first presidential candidate to go into Little Haiti itself and ask for the Haitian American vote. And it's, you know, if you look at the history of things, the Republican Party has always believed that within the African American community, one place they could make inroads was with Haitians. Haitians are known to be very industrious, very hardworking when it comes particularly to entrepreneurship, creating businesses. Haitian Americans have an amazing record of coming to this country, saving money, putting it together and starting businesses. The very ideals that Republicans so much like, the entrepreneurship, they're also conservative when it comes on social issues. The Republicans have always thought Haitians were fertile ground. This does not help Republicans bring Haitians into the fold. And what about the Haitians who work on uh, President Trump's properties? Mar-a-Lago, you know, maybe a good suggestion would be for the president to maybe wander around Mar-a-Lago a bit and talk to some of the Haitian Americans who I'm sure are on his staff or here at the Trump Doral Tower. Jim DeFiti, Jim, thank you very much. Jim, we'll have much more on the controversy surrounding the president's remarks Sunday on Facing South Florida. Catch it Sunday morning, 8.30, right here on CBS4.